Hello, I'm Susan Nash, and I'm very happy to be here today to share with you some of the findings from a 20-week series of webinars that we called Pivoting During the Pandemic, New Revenue and Diversification Strategies. We started in April and went through basically um, September. We'll be starting another series soon, but this one in particular had some very interesting findings. The structure of the workshops was basically, um, we started let on Wednesday evenings and it went from 7 to 8.30 p.m., so an hour and a half, tried to have four speakers on a theme that had to do with um, what people were doing to pivot during these challenging times, uh, challenging times of not just COVID-19, but also supply chain issues, collapse of commodities prices, namely oil and gas prices, and other affiliated kinds of issues that introduced um, sometimes actually what seemed to be um, permanent changes in the way that we do business, and some really new pathways in terms of, of business in general. So essentially, the um, we had some really interesting webinars with the with the four different speakers, different perspectives. We tried to get speakers who were not just talking about their experiences with new technologies, but also people who were actually investing or looking for new technologies. So kind of bringing together multiple viewpoints. And it's very interesting. So if you see the link, go ahead and, and click on it. And um, actually it won't be so easy in YouTube. <laughs> I'll put a link in to the, the series and you can watch the different recordings. There are, there, it was a 20 week series, but there are actually only 19 recordings because we didn't record every single one. And anyway, so there, there are many different topics. Today I'm going to talk to you about the findings and what that means about opportunities in the time of COVID-19. So you might think, hmm, COVID time and opportunities in the time of COVID-19, that sounds kind of Gabriel Garcia uh, Marquez-esque. Love, love in the time of cholera, right? Well, there are some similarities and it's not a coincidence I decided on that, that title because the thing about love in the time of cholera, love is this thing that one pursues with passion even though one gets abused by love and and just sort of mauled by it and I thought okay this is similar to what's happening now with people's interests and their passions passions for creativity different opportunities COVID-19 and the world we live in what's happening now is um, tending to maul us but with passion and determination there are opportunities so let's like start and say, okay, what happened? What did COVID-19 do? Well, COVID-19 is a major disruptor and yet it accelerated what was already in motion. So there's a demand drop in hydrocarbons, oil and gas leading to price collapse. Um, often, much of it had to do with the fact that there is a complete d drop in demand in terms of air travel and also um, um, cruise ships, etc. But there's a demand surge for electricity and energy storage because many people are, are working remotely, they're using more electricity. Another disruptor, supply chain breakdowns. Then political uncertainty, social upheavals, food insecurity, in some areas, uh, at least a perception of, of impending food insecurity, which led to the classic run on toilet paper and 
beans <laughs> and rice <laughs> and staples and now people are tired of their beans and rice anyway climate driven catastrophes fire hurricanes other trends that were already in motion energy transition net zero carbon phase outs Another trend, cloud-based computing, remote operations. Automation is already in motion. Faster and more efficient computing, facilitating massive data collection and the extreme deployment of sensors and data gathering. Also distributed workforces. And again, another thing, border controls, national identities. For all the talk about open borders, and how people should not be restricted. It was amazing to see how all that went out the window and people cheerfully accepted border controls and border closings when they thought that infected people might come in. It's very interesting how that happened. So what has happened we have broad categories of opportunities. So first is in cost savings and efficiencies, optimization, automation, supply chain, monitoring, Internet of Things and its sensors. So all kinds of opportunities that ha can occur if you bring optimization and efficiency to the table. And then another broad category of opportunity has to do with maintaining safe, reliable operations. So we can say radical op automation. We see a lot of remote operations. We see unmanned platforms. In the, so it's a lot like mining. It's a lot of activity going on, but no people there. Also see another thing is remote sensing, satellite, drone, sensors. So you see a surge in opportunities to develop, um, develop solutions that allow you to monitor the surface, monitor the facilities, monitor um, flows of s substances on the surface, monitor heat, fire, etc. When fire, or when, when fire, when travel is not in, not possible. Remote sensing using satellites, drones, sensors allow you to do impact assessments, operations planning, execution, automation, also security and su surveillance, and above all, inspections, remotely, inexpensively. Other areas of, of opportunity that came up that we could see in this 20 week, se week series, energy integration and storage. So look at, at the systems in the big picture. First, there's energy integration, offshore, unconventional, conventional oil and gas, integrating all different types of energies. So gas, solar, wind, geothermal, and then optimizing them with smart grids and local grids. Also talking about hydrogen storage and also CCUS for enhanced oil recovery and also CO2 storage. So a lot of companies have said, we are diversifying. We are getting into the energy business, not just energy exploration, but also energy storage, energy distribution. And that means a whole new level of skill sets are needed. That translates into opportunity. So what do we mean about energy storage? battery technologies, critical minerals, critical mineral exploration and development, energy security, also ideas of hydrogen storage. Here's a, a one, a, a hydrogen storage in a Utah salt cavern. So compliance. There's a focus on the most appropriate equipment and software large-scale plugging, abandoning. So state regulations require a report prepared by an engineer and a geologist to be filed with each plugged and abandoned well. 
that translates into opportunities for engineers and geologists. Also, um, saltwater disposal, induced seismicity, um, abatement, or, or um, so compliance with regulations, also complies with emission standards. Methane is a key concern, so there are many different ways to detect methane. Also, groundwater and surface water protection. And then there's coastal erosion. A lot of things having to do with insurance companies, insurance, um, insurance claims. Other opportunities have to do with new technologies that expand the way we see the subsurface. Think about this. How can we find high quality reservoirs, even within shales, in new ways using the data that we have, but transforming it? How can we model structural stability? For example, for buildings and infrastructure, especially in seismically active areas. Another one is what do we see in the subsurface in terms of geothermal energy? Do we see um, heat flows, fracture systems, groundwater, seismicity? Do we see um, stress fields? Also, seismic surveys, not just for oil and gas, but also for hydrogen and CCUS, for storage, etc. Another opportunity comes in taking a look at the massive new repositories of data, and, and then also thinking about ways to work with the data, cloud computing. So we have storage of data, mirroring the data, platforms, apps on the platforms, <laughs> Platform, app, app, platform. <laughs> it's interesting how we can layer and layer and, and, and utilize all those things for data transformation, for machine learning, for deep learning, for identifying patterns, for, data, uh, for predicting behavior. So the data issue, data discovery. Where are the hidden or overlooked sources of data? So one huge area of possibilities is finding data that's not currently being used to its full potential. Also look at public data. It can be confusing because it's in inconsistent forms and formats. Also data can be locked in image files or text files or PDFs or more. Also we could have data in repositories where there's a great deal of duplication, redundancy. So how do we deal with all this data? When we look at the discovery, what do we want out of it? What can we do with it? Second step, data cleaning. And it's not just the data. It's all about knowing the data's origins and associated processes. So we can identify the ways that data collection can be flawed. It's important in the data cleaning process. Identify the ways that data storage could introduce errors and work with teams to review the workflows and processes that might introduce error, and also ones that could de detect where errors have occurred. Then develop and test algorithms that check data accuracy, quality, integrity, and then also test the algorithms over and over, the ones that test that clean data. Now, let's keep in mind there are massive platforms that encourage developing your own fit-for-purpose applications. So much entrepreneurial potential. So Google is all about helping you um, get started to kind of create your own world. IBM is the same, Microsoft, Azure. Um, AWS, Amazon Web Services, Akamai, EPAM. And so, for example, Amazon Web Services has an entire division dedicated to helping you build on AWS, build your platform, your app, and then dig into the um, data. 
there were a few ambitious new attempts to harness the earth's geological data again entrepreneurial potential deep time digital earth is a global unification of many different entities to who will allow people to be able to have open access to not just the open access data that's out there but also open access to applications there's the open subsurface data universe that assures that the data is usable to buy and then that's this is similar and in endeavor energistics also introduces standards and then you have organizations like earthpeel who that earthpeel is all about finding ways to to transform data and use it so as we went through the 20 weeks we found that there were some pretty pretty intractable issues being caused by covid and for and not just the covid the disease but the consequent closing of borders the collapse of of certain industries so we found that the short term effect were some massive supply chain blocks some um some people just could not get their parts in from china and it, even if they did it took weeks longer months longer and then the other issue is that even if you could get it manufactured in china could you actually get it to the united states or to wherever you wanted it to go and you know to be honest sometimes no because you may not realize this but there is a massive shortage of shipping containers like how can that be i just saw an article about how people are using these shipping containers to transform them into like um mini homes for for people low cost micro homes but it's interesting that th those are the the old type of containers that are no longer um, considered viable i think some of them had the wrong kind of paint or some kind of substance that that they they are being um oh not used but i'm not sure that i'm completely correct in that because i can't imagine if it had a toxic paint or chemical that you would then just immediately turn it into a home for homeless that doesn't make sense so <laughs> but there's something that's making um the chinese government or the chinese providers of containers to stop um and and retire and make them retire the ones that they had and there just aren't enough coming back into the system and i'm not sure about other origins of containers i'm sure there are other manufacturers of containers um but what an opportunity if you know how to make a shipping container you are in business <laughs> forever <laughs> at least in the in the next 18 months um so the other thing too that's a way to tackle the supply chain issues but also other issues have to do with like um what to do to to anticipate when you'll need a part so predictive maintenance for triggered ordering blockchain to assure the integrity of the financial flow eliminating sole source supply situations and even doing 3d printing parts as a contingency backup so in case you can't get it already have your plan already have your file for 3d printing and already have the place where you want to get it printed there bottom line lean is not as important as secure in these times so we have to rebalance supply and demand in the near term and the long term so one of the things like what are we what are we going to do with the tsunami of auctioned equipment of companies that service companies going out of business declaring bankruptcy cutting costs they are divesting themselves of just a massive amount of of equipment so what does this mean it's like oh mm, i'm going to go buy a mud logging unit it's a good investment uh yes no maybe 
<laughs> Obviously, the most important factor right now is agility. So something that is fit for one purpose and not modifiable is probably not your best near near term or medium term opportunity or even long term. However, if you can repurpose the now unneeded commercial and industrial real estate, you're in good shape. So repurposing could be, okay, generic, more or less generic trucks, trailers, um, equipment. That That is a wonderful investment if you can find it. Smart grids, local solutions for the last mile to increase the remote work from home locations. Those are also areas of demand, in this, like in the smart grid. So what are some of the implications of our so-called new normal? Um, so what is your new normal? New normal it, it takes on different a different um, appearance, but chances are the new normal for you is probably the same as the new normal for me. Working remotely, not traveling, um, doing a lot of things collaboratively at a distance. So what does that mean? It means need for remote training, repurposing of the skills and knowledge you need. And you need, there's a need for new ways to think of energy, storing energy data. There's a need for remote workspaces that provide the software and also cloud storage and like a virtual workbench or toolkit that has a pay-as-you-go plan so that you can actually become a service provider or a consultant or um and so the 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 other implications of the new normal is that there's a lot of opportunity in financial a lot of banks right now are are looking at the fact that there are opportunities to purchase gas reserves at a low price with the idea that eventually natural gas will be a bridge is always it has been considered a bridge energy but even more so in the future to be able to generate electricity and create local solutions for energy and we're seeing something kind of interesting phenomenon too in a movement of people from the large cities to smaller cities we're seeing a lot of growth in the so-called gateway cities it's a gateway city well a gateway to a national park for example so if you happen to be in a town kind of touristy town usually maybe just big in the, in the summer abandoned in the winter that's changing a lot of people are opting to live year-round in a town like that i was thinking of one that comes to mind spearfish canyon it's kind of a gateway to the black hills it is a beautiful place and i would imagine that it's kind of booming right now because like it's pretty in, in, in its own right with trout fishing and and Oh, just, you know, 30 minutes from some really cool places in, in the Black Hills. Wonderful hiking, lots of bicycling. I think it's probably pretty cold and miserable in the winter. Well, clearly it's going to be cold. But what people are saying is that they want to be able to be with nature. And they are want, and since they can work remotely, I'm thinking, why not live in a place where I'm 30 minutes away from a beautiful hike instead of planning it for um, six months and then, you know, having one, one vacation a year. Why not live the dream? <laughs> live the dream of shoveling snow. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so another opportunity we're going to see is teaching and learning new models it can start grassroots and scale. So thanks for te with to technology, it's very possible and, and actually uh, desirable to start at a grassroots level and then try out your training programs, um, anything, 
in different platforms. You could want to, may want to use Moodle if you want it to be able to generate um, have like a generate a, a full solution that allows you to do assessments and print out certificates and all that. And and also you can try out things that maybe you're, you're doing. The, the system would work with children and then also professionals. So you can also like pioneer doing small groups led by experts to do some kind of a hybrid web conferencing that is not just a web conference, but it also has a, a way for, for people to, to demonstrate their skills and uh, have a, a true assessment strategy. You can chunk content. You, you can have that same learning management system can be used for conferences. And in a conference, you can incorporate micro learning and assessments for badges. So the, what we're seeing is virtual um, conferences that tend to be all just about Zoom and breakout rooms and all that and coordinating recording. Okay, there's that, but there's also a way to use some existing ca capabilities and capacity in a learning management system, not just a content management system, that allows you to incorporate discussion boards, for example, and chat, and and like and to, to archive it. So there's so many things also to be able to do self-grading um, modules and, and that upon uh, completion, at a certain rate showing mastery, it automatically generates a certificate or a badge. So, so cool. Also, you can do virtual apprenticeships and internships. So it's a duplicate. <laughs> Analytics and careers and energy. It's tempting to think that, oh my goodness, everybody has to become a data scientist. Mm, no. It's a bit, a bit like when you decided to become a geologist, you had to take chemistry if you wanted to be um, at, or in, and also organic chemistry, or you needed to take physics. You're not a physicist. You're not a you're not a chemist, but you needed those skills and that knowledge base. Analytics is the same. So, whatever programming languages you learned in the past, it's not just about programming languages. Now, it's what to do with the data, where to store it, how to work with your team members. So, you need a knowledge of analytics, and you need to be able to program at least a little bit, and you need to know where to find the um, downloads of the, the languages, the, the platforms. The, um, you need to learn, you know, understand like the environment, Jupyter Notebook. You need to find repositories, GitHub, etc. Not that you will be spending all your time coding, but that you will be talking and communicating to people will be building platforms and uh, enabling you to do things. So you need to be uh, in cross-functional teams. And one of those cross-functional types of teams would be data management in collaborative environments. So again, cloud computing literacy is a must-have capability to be able to identify key data Prepare the data so it's usable. For example, unstructured to structured data. Clean the data. Um, develop the architecture for data lake. Make sure they're well organized and are accessible for everybody in a secure way. Also, understand what data, data integrity means. And also, data quality as it relates to your projects, goals, and objectives. So just as an example, let's think about satellite imagery. Huge area of opportunity. If you are creative, you can come up with different ways to look at data and to incorporate that in a service that you provide or a product that you've, that you've developed. So for example, Maxar owns and operates satellites with a 110 petabyte imagery archive. 
so there are just different um, ways to to do um, urban planning and also say landscaping um, project management another idea that's intriguing to me and I will share my idea <laughs> so okay Let's think about ground penetrating radar and all different kinds of things that we're doing now with, um, oh, say gra gravity and, and magnetics, drone base, etc. Used to be small airplanes. How precise is that anymore? And, and to what degree is it precise? So what are some of the things that we might want to find? I mean, a lot of people have talked about, oh, well, you can find, um, orphan wells, or wells that need to be cleaned up that are now hidden, they're old wells. Yeah, you can, because it's metal, it's easy. But how about density differences in, say, a shale layer that is fossiliferous, or dinosauriferous, or reptilianiferous? <laughs> I'm thinking specifically about how to high grade your your quest for say a large fossil we, we've probably read you probably read something about the t-rex the, the that was sold for what 138 million well i mean okay not everybody's gonna be able to find that kind of fossil and and then obviously there's some ethical issues about like selling it like that but like in england if you uh find treasure and apparently it's everywhere with met, met, metal detectors. They have these detectivists who go out with their metal detectors. They actually find Anglo-Saxon hordes and, you know, jewels and, and um, well, a lot of times it's cloisonné and intricately um, uh, braided types of, 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 of metalwork incredibly fine. Anyway, they find those, and there's a, a law that like the, the government actually um, will preserve it, but then the finder gets some some kind of uh, reward. I don't know if it's the same for dinosaurs and dinosaur bones, but I just wonder how effective it would be to use some of the new technologies for going to the Burgess Shale or Morrison Formation or some of those places and and speeding up the process of finding the really, really good specimens. Anyway, it's my thought. <laughs> I know some places, I don't know, like, like for example, in the Cretaceous, um, the nautiloids, uh, nautilus shells, nautiloids, and Lake Texoma, they're pretty massive. I don't know. They're all on the surface. I'm not sure that that a drone and surface penetrating radar would help you. But anyway, I digressed. <laughs> anyway, so let's talk about data analysis in a collaborative environment, workflows that are fit for purpose, operations monitoring data collected either through manual input, streaming through fiber optics, data cleaning, Identify the main uses of data, machine learning, etc. And then again, just to to reiterate, supply chain applies to all industries, including data. So think about supply chain, pinch points, etc. Supply chain thinking is all about interconnectedness and causality. So think about your data as a supply chain and keep a graphic model of the interconnectedness of all the processes, goods, services, payments, whatever, not just a workflow, but interconnectedness. You might even start with a mind map, but track the flows of information, stakeholder behaviors, ordering payments, and then diagram the processes used in the production of goods and services, and then identify pinch points and sole suppliers. Consider causal chains, also consider risk points. So I've really enjoyed talking to you about what I think is 
a step into the future and and I'm looking forward to to continuing to analyze the different findings from from the, the, the series of of individuals making presentations and talking about their pivoting experiences and their new technologies and what they see for the future. I mean, it's kind of amazing when you think about it. 20, so it meant average of four speakers, then there's zero three. So we're talking about at least 65, 70 different speakers with different messages. And so the key takeaway for me is that The future involves putting all the pieces that we can have together and using data and also insights and experience in a proactive way. And in terms of data, think about data acquisitions from all sources, data analytics, automated actions, and then finally supply chain thinking. So I, I hope that this has been useful for you and I look forward to your thoughts, and thank you. I'm Susan Nash, and you've been listening to a presentation on pivoting.